you. It's a pleasure for the school to host District Attorney O'Keefe and Senator Dina Cito, along with the Chamber, as well as all of our guests here today. Uh, it's always nice to have you up on the campus, and I'm confident that the uh, presentation will, will go well and we'll have an opportunity for us to get dialogue this morning. That said, I'm going to turn things over to uh, the Executive Director of the Canal Region Chamber of Commerce, Maria Oliva. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Maria Oliva from the Cape Cod Canal Region Chamber of Commerce, and I want to thank you all for hosting this event for us. And uh, this is an important um, part of the legislative process, and I'd like to introduce Michael O'Keefe, who's our district attorney, and Senator Vinnie Pinicito. Um, they're here to speak to the issue. Um, if you have any questions, please um, consider those uh, after the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't think we need uh, any microphones or anything. <laughs> We're kind of a small but very important and influential group on the board. So I, I want to just begin by indicating to you that um, we, in both law enforcement world and the public health world are very concerned about this ballot question. And as a result of that, Senator DiMacito, myself, and a number of other people uh, urge Governor Baker to carefully consider this. And he did so. And when he did, he came out very strongly leading this effort to oppose this ballot question. And really that gave birth to Campaign for a Safe and Healthy Massachusetts, which is a legally filed uh, opposition uh, campaign with the Office of Campaign and Political Finance. Because after all, this is just like any other election. And the more people learn about this issue, the more we feel they're going to come to the conclusion that this is simply not good public policy for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And that's really what the campaign to oppose the legalization of the commercial marijuana industry in Massachusetts is all about. The Safe and Healthy Massachusetts is a growing bipartisan coalition of families and community leaders in healthcare, the Massachusetts Hospital Association, the Massachusetts Medical Society, the Association of Behavioral Healthcare in Business, Associated Industries of Massachusetts, which is a very significant and robust organization, came up right away against this. And added to that now, but it hasn't yet been added to this little slide, is the Retailers Association of Massachusetts. And interestingly enough, at first the retailers said, well, you know, there might be a lot of of our members who are, you know, we don't know how they feel. So a presentation was made to them, and then they overwhelmingly voted to join this coalition and oppose this. And they are a very, again, uh, healthy and strong group, and we're just delighted to have them. The Massachusetts Association of Superintendents uh, has joined in opposing this. All Massachusetts district attorneys and let me suggest to you that there are 11 elected DAs, and we don't agree on everything. They're Republicans and Democrats, but we all agree on this, that this is bad public policy for Massachusetts. Also added to that, the unanimous opposition by every sheriff in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And as I, I mentioned- And the chief of police as well. The right, entire right. chief of police as well. And the elected officials, of course, are, are really too numerous to uh, list at this point. But Governor Charlie Baker, Boston Mayor Ryan Walsh, Speaker Robert DeLeon, uh, the Attorney General of the Commonwealth, Mara Hill. So the list goes on and on. Now, it's important to understand the context into which this ballot question fits. We decriminalize the possession of marijuana in 2008. People are not being arrested for or receiving a criminal record for possession of marijuana. 
And even way before 2008, you were legally entitled to a continuance without a finding if you were arrested for possession of marijuana. And so you did not receive a criminal record even then, yet that's what was being sold as a reason for decriminalizing marijuana. And, you know, there's some disingenuousness, if you will, to some of the claims that are made uh, on the proponents' side of these issues. In 2012, we legalized access for medical purposes, and people who want access to marijuana for health purposes are getting access. But let me suggest something to you, ladies and gentlemen. There are approximately 24,000 or so medical marijuana cards now uh, issued in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And the original legislation brought to us again by way of a ballot was eight enumerated conditions, glaucoma, cancer, you know, that you could get your medical marijuana card for. But then the last of those was other. So you had all these conditions that you could get the medical marijuana card, and then other. 90% of those who hold the medical marijuana card are suffering from other. I, I don't know what that is, but that's the basis upon which they have received their medical marijuana. The, the you know, in the 60s, when a lot of people were smoking marijuana and exposed to a danger about my vintage, you know, you remember those days, the stuff that grew in the ground in Mexico and the southeastern, southwestern part of the United States was about 2.5% THC. That's marijuana growing in the ground. But like seedless grapes, you can, you know, make this stuff into something else. And boy, is it something else today. It is. You can see the potency level and how it's grown. And it's as high as 18%. And in, interestingly enough, in the Netherlands, which has had legalized marijuana for years, they're now reclassifying anything above, I think it's 15%, anything above 15% as a hard drug. Because this stuff is, as it's hydroponically grown and has different strains, etc. weaved into it. Somebody probably here at the tech school knows a lot more about agriculture than me would tell you how that's done, but it's done. And so the stuff today is far more potent than what we were exposed to when I was a kid. And to add to that, the, that is the marijuana, the joint that you know of, but there's also the edible aspects, which are even more potent than that. So we, you find them. They even have a product called Shatter, which is basically the, the, the hashish oil that they will modify up to, and I had gone to Colorado, so they showed us this in the, in the industry, up to 90% THC. And it's they call Shatter, it's like peanut brittle. They break it off and they smoke it in a bong with 90% THC. So talk about a hard drug. This is a hard drug that will be sold at any corner shop if this is legalized. At any store that you can find, a convenience store, uh, it, it, that will is what's sold. So it's not just the joint that's far more potent, it is the edible products. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about edible products, but those are far more potent than, than the marijuana cigarette. And of course, as I talk about it, it's the gen genetically modified, where they're able to pull out the, you know, the THC, the hashish oil, they make this product far more potent than even before. And so that's another big concern that I, I know a lot of people aren't talking about, but it's something that we learned through the process of seeing what happened in Colorado. And that, that's the phrase I was looking for, it's that it was modified. Next. Uh, the, what's the ballot question really about opening the door to a billion dollar for-profit marijuana industry that 
commercial marijuana industry is big business and profits are a huge motivation for many of these actors. And just look for yourself and see. This is a you know, Massachusetts focus. This is big money looking to make big profits. And how do you do that in any business? You expand your market. That's what this is all about. Next. The profit model, aggressive marketing. Look at some of this stuff. The St. Patty's Day special, $17 for an eighth of an ounce, I assume that means. Um, and then the, the sort of goodwill stuff, Clean Colorado, sponsored by Metro Cannabis. Uh, marijuana didn't ruin his career or his life. And the marijuana industry profit model focuses on these edibles as much as I believe. So the edibles, if we're right now, what happened is, of course, Colorado was the first one. So when they came out with this, they were able to, to go and do whatever they wanted as far as marketing, and they put these products out. Since then, the laws have tightened up. However, this valve question is before us doesn't talk about any of this stuff. They allow this to be decided by the Cannabis Control Commission that is going to decide what is and what's not available. Some will argue that they're going to put all kinds of restrictions in, in Massachusetts. However, the way the ballot question is written, we are going to have, and we know now, in Colorado, 50% of the products that are sold are edibles. For edible products that it's not the joint, it is candies, cookies, gummy beers, lip balm, butter, you name it, they put it in every every product. And so what you'll see is you have the meta mints, you have the candies, the cookies, the you know, ice cream, you name it, they, they infuse that that hashish oil into that product. And of course, this was some of the creative advertising. Since then, the you know, as you can imagine, copyright infringements and whatnot, they they've been pulled back and the, the state has tried to pull back in doing this. But you've got to understand that the industry will do whatever is allowed. They will push the envelope because clearly they're going to make money from this. And so when you think about it, a billion dollar industry, half of it, $500 million, is in the world of edibles. And that's really uh, makes it more accessible and frankly more susceptible, to, in my opinion, to younger people. And that's a real concern because those, are, I believe, are the clientele that they want for the long term because you get them uh, you know, using your product and that's the goal. It is, you know, to, to get more and more customers to find them. And uh, much of this stuff, unfortunately, is already here. And I'm going to show you just some photos. I'm not going to leave these back. But this is from a bus about you know, two months ago. So right here and more. And there's a you know, end with $17,000 in gold, U.S. currency. Here's some Indiana Indica marijuana. These are the jars of hashish. These are various candy products. That's what ash looks like. The potency of this stuff is enormous. These little blue files contain hash oil. Blue dream capsules, so you can take it in a pill form. Here's some just regular old leafy green weed. And this is butter for your bread, marijuana. Chocolate truffles and other candy items. So this is already here. And of course, we already talked about this. Is again, 50% of the industry, you can see the drinks, the different products that they, you know, that they sell in the stores that sell the pot. Next slide. Now this is something that just to give you a sense of how prolific this is. This is 
in, Mar in Colorado in two years, and this is advertised in the, by the industry that there are now more shops that sell marijuana, 700 than there are McDonald's and Starbucks combined. So in two years, you can see the proliferation of this industry quickly. And here's an interesting fact. That reality is in a third of the state, because two thirds of the state does not allow it. Because when that ballot initiative was first done, they, you had to opt in. So when you opt, opted in, you, you voted to, you know, to say we wanted marijuana. Well, many of the, the, the communities never did that. So a third of the state allows this, two thirds of the state doesn't, and still you see that significant number of 700 as, as opposed to 573 McDonald's and Starbucks. So what you'll see in the industry is you'll see this go everywhere. Now the way the ballot question is written in this particular case in Massachusetts, there is no opt-in anymore, it's opt-out. So you have to vote to get out of it. So there actually has to be a vote taken by the community to vote to say we don't want the marijuana as opposed, otherwise it, it would be legal in the community. So they learn from, and again, this is a nationwide, a nationwide um, campaign. And so they learn from what happened in Colorado that to get it more accessible in the entire state, you do opt in as opposed to opt. If you do opt, opt out, did I get that right? Okay. Yeah, you do opt out as opposed to opt in. So to that extent, um, this is something that we will find. I believe we're going to see more of it in Massachusetts because of that that clause. Again, it's a 24 page. Uh, ballot questions. Most people are going to go in and they're going to read the, the top line, marijuana legal or not. But I always say the devil's in the details. And those are the things that we learned when we went, the eight of us who went to Colorado and really kind of spent some time. What are we dealing with? And those are some of the things that we learned. Can you talk a little more about the senators who went and what they Well, there was uh, eight of us that went. And we initially, uh, Jason Lewis was the gentleman who initially was put on this to do some research because the Senate president um, who really had no opposition in, in regards to the legalization of marijuana, and he initially thought it was a, an okay idea. However, he put it in there because he realized that there were going to be legislative actions because we've seen what has Colorado had to do. There were definitely legislative actions that Colorado had to do after the fact, and they had to play a lot of catch up. And, uh, and so um, what ended up happening is we got to understand uh, as, as we went how big of an industry this is. We spent an entire day with the industry. We met with law enforcement. We met with legislators. We met with every group that would have touched this. We met with the Commissioner of Agriculture and talked to the Commissioner of Agriculture. How does this affect your, your uh, industry? And so after we all did this, there was a, a clear changing of the minds of many people and thinking, yeah, you know, this is probably going to happen. And I've heard this a lot. A lot of people say, oh, you know, this is definitely going to happen because they didn't know the other side of it. And frankly, most people would have never known the other side of it if it were not for this group that came out and just said, you know what, even if you're okay with this, isn't it a good idea to get both sides of an equation? And we're out here, you know, the district attorney, I, the governor, the attorney general, the speaker, the mayor, we're out here to try to give people the other side of the equation. This is the totality of this. So when we came back, um, we realized, oh my gosh, this is far more extensive, and we don't believe that Massachusetts after studying it, we put together a report that was just, these are the things that we would have to do if it were to become legal. But after that, we decided, you know what, it's just not enough to just sit back and just say, you know, hey, that's it. We decided to go out there and just educate people on the other side of the equation is that you need to know these facts before you make this decision. We're in Massachusetts, probably one of the most educated states in, in, in the nation, and facts are important. Figures are important. Education is important. So we're educating people about the reality of what's happening. And so um, we all came back and were very much uh, taken and taken back by what we learned. And we are, seven of the eight of us were in opposition to the legalization of them. One is just neutral, um, didn't want to take a position. Uh, but I think that speaks volumes of eight people who went out there and, um, and now know a lot more. And I think as people know more, there's certainly going to be some pause in regards to what we're doing. One of the um, really pernicious aspects of this is where marijuana is legalized, teen use rises. In Colorado, in the 12 to 17 year old age group, 
they are up 20% having legalized recreational marijuana as compared to prior to the legalization of recreational now the proponents will tell you that's not the case, that it's actually, it's actually gone down. I mean, we've created a billion dollar industry that's gone down. The reality is, is that you, you can have studies that will tell you anything. That study was actually done by the, by, uh, uh, the National Drug DEA for the globalization in cooperation with Rocky Mountain, and, uh, I, and I'll get you all the information if you're interested. However, it is, people will tell you, you know, oh, it, it's actually gone down. I don't know, but you just facts and figures. You have more, you have more uh, pot shops than McDonald's and, and Starbucks combined. You have a billion dollar new industry, and it's actually going down. I, I dare say, I believe those numbers. I believe that it has, actually has increased. And when you talk to people in the emergency rooms, when you talk to school officials, when you talk to law enforcement, which we did, they will tell you the opposite. Yeah. You know, those stats that So, so it, this is something that in this ballot question it allows 
and up to six pot plants, six pot plants per individual or 12 in a home. So if you're over the age of 21, you're allowed to grow up to, you know, uh, up to 12 plants uh, if you're married and in your home. So what does, what does that mean? And I think, you know, we all think of plants, you know, small plants. The reality is, is when you sit, and I can show you some pictures that actually happen with me. When you grow these plants, if you want to be good at it and spend some time, what you can do is you'll see that these pot plants will grow to full maturity in approximately five months. They will yield up to a pound of, of uh, uh, pot, which is the bud, which is, you know, it's, it's not the plant, it is the bud. It will grow up to a pound. So you look at that and you say, well, a pound, well, that's a significant amount of money. When an ounce, if you look at it, you can see an ounce in Colorado will go up to $250 per ounce for the more potent stuff. And so if that's the case, then you can yield, one plant can yield up to $5,000. Of course, take five months, you do the math, and so now you're looking at uh, you know $60,000 in five months in your home. In a year, $120,000. So the argument is this is going to decrease uh, that stuff coming in from Mexico. It, it's going to stop. It's going to stop the, you know the, that. What I suggest here is when you start allowing these home growth, first of all, you basically law enforcement says we give up. We can't do this. Before law enforcement could see that your electric pills were going, you know, they had to smell the, the smell in the homes, and they would come in and stop. Now you can't because people can legally do this. And so what I believe is you're going to have a proliferation of, of a what I call a gray market. So something that's grown legally here, however, it is exported and sold illegally. And I would suggest to the to the shops that will they have to carve because they you know they could lose their licenses. There'll be an entire industry that will be growing it to sell to those under 21 that don't necessarily have that. So you're going to see a far more great proliferation of this because of this part of the legislation that no one really talks about, but the fact that it won't grow. And again, they say this because of the fact that it is, you know, you know, it, it will stop the black market from Mexico coming in. Now we we have seen, uh, you know, and, and spending a lot of time in this that in Colorado we're seeing a, a growing of the black market in, in Cuban nationals and uh, Mexican nationals actually coming and growing it legally in Colorado and then exporting it right from there. So that argument, I think, is, is a false argument. And you know, all of these laws allegedly prohibit the sale of you know, marijuana to kids under 21. So where do you think the black market's going to be? They're going to go after the people who can't buy the stuff. Legally. And you know, I think one of the things that the black market here is for drugs, because we legalize something, they're going to throw their hands up and say, "Okay, I'll you know I'll try to I'll get a license and I'll pay tax and you know, please." We talked talk about, about this. That's a, just an illustration of the you know, localities of pot shops right in downtown Denver. Even if the ballot question were to pass, marijuana would still be illegal under federal law. It creates numerous challenges and complications, including state government would need to take on their costly responsibilities like ensuring product safety and regulation of pesticides, normally roles of the FDA and the EPA, but of course, the federal government's not going to be any help at all because it's illegal. Banks are unwilling to do business with the marijuana industry, resulting in large cash transactions and serious security issues. Imagine this multi-billion dollar industry, all cash. What kind of problems do you think that creates in Colorado and Washington? Just, just to go back right there, just the state government, is when we met with the Commissioner of Agriculture, he shared with us that 80 to 90 percent of his day is dealing now with the industry of marijuana, whereas before it was, you know, farms and all of the other things that go along with an agricultural dealing with agriculture. Now, just to keep track of this, just to decide which pesticides and herbicides can you use, something I never even frankly never even thought about this, but what type of fertilizers and pesticides are you using in the pot that you grow, especially in the in the home grows? Because who can go and test all of these private little home grows? You know, you 
you, do you go and buy ortho? Do you go and buy, I mean, some of these pesticides, I know when you know they, they come into my lawn, they say don't walk on the lawn because of the chemical nature of it. Those are gonna be ingested into your lungs, they're going to be, um, they're going to be eaten, and so those are things that you really have to think about. I frankly never gave a lot of thought to. And so, um, and that's all gonna be done by the state. The state has to regulate this, not the federal government, because the federal government, again, it's illegal. So that becomes a burden on the tax. On the tax. And so, you know, this notion that you'll hear from the proponents that we're going to realize all this tax revenue in front of we're gonna help with our schools, and we're gonna do this, we're gonna fix the infrastructure and all that, it's nonsense. We won't be able to pay for the regulatory scheme that it's gonna require in order to, to effectuate this were it to pass. So what will happen then? You, the taxpayers, in effect, will be subsidizing this multi-million dollar industry. It, it's, you know, it makes no sense. Additional legal complications. Unlike driving under the influence of alcohol, there is no per se blood limit like we have for alcohol. There is no equivalent breathalyzer test. There are no established procedures and protocols. And frankly, there's a lack of law enforcement training and, and resources to deal with this issue. I, again, you know, I hate to keep referencing my antiquity in this job, but in the years that I've been a prosecutor, I can count probably on one hand the amount of cases, even though it's always been illegal to drive under influence of drugs in Massachusetts, where that was the sole track driving under the influence of drugs. By contrast, hundreds of thousands of cases dropped under the influence. And why is that? Because there's no really good way to detect it. Now, there are inventive companies in California and right here in Massachusetts. I got a call from Mass General Hospital a week or so ago regarding something they're working on to be able to detect uh, the THC level of a person. And it's very tricky because there are metabolites of tetrahydrocannabinol that stay in your system for days and days and days. But you have to be able to measure the active THC in your system, and that's what MGH is working on doing. So, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what happens. But, you know, we have problems occasionally with the breathalyzer. You may have read something about that not too long ago. Um, you know, it's a machine. It's made by humans. It, it has issues like, you know, it has to be operated properly and all that. We would have to replicate that entire structure for marijuana if put every police department in all 400 is it 36 towns in the So it must be a reservoir. Yeah, <laughs> that was a call the reservoir. <laughs> so anyway, uh, at, at an enormous cost, at an enormous cost, not to mention the training that the police would have to go to be able to do this. And since we, since we legalized medical marijuana, if the police stop a cop, and in the normal, you know, go up, license and registration, and the window opens, and if marijuana is billowing out of the cup, the police, according to the Supreme Judicial Court, because of the medical marijuana, have no ability to do anything with respect to the issue of probable cause to inquire further about marijuana. Think about that. That's how nutty we've become. And so with that, it just, it just so you think about the significance of the fact that we're on the cusp of legalizing this entirely new industry, um, and we don't have a real good mechanism in place. Even if you're supportive of this, one would suggest it's probably not a bad idea to have a good mechanism in place to be able to, to deal with the issue of drug driving. Drug driving is real, it happens. We all know the sad story that happened just recently with Trooper Mc, uh, McCarty there when he was on the side of the road and somebody who had just purchased you know, marijuana in Brookline and was had a smack, hat, smoke joint in his automobile um, crashed into his automobile. It happens. This is not, you know, uh, you know, oh, that's, 
theoretical, it is real. And so when you look at this, you look at, you know, he has a, a statistic that was really shocking to us. This came after we went, went back from Colorado, just recently out there, AAA, they're not even part of our organization, we didn't even know about this, but they actually, because of what's happening in Colorado and Washington State, it's legalized. They did this study. The marijuana was legalized in 2014, and in that year, 17% of the fatal crashes were involved with, with pot. That's up from 8% in 2013. So you think about that. In a year, we've seen that big of an increase. These are fatalities, people who died. So what happened in 2013? 46 people died. In 2014, 106 people died. Those are real statistics. And that's something that I think should give everyone pause because I don't know how you can uh, open up an industry like this and not have a, a real safety net in place to at least try to protect the public from people driving under the influence of pot. And I have to believe, and maybe I'm wrong, but there are people that will say, it's better to be high on pot than to be drunk on alcohol because if I'm driving, I can get busted with the alcohol, but my chances of getting out if I'm dry, high and driving are much better. And so it, it, there's another concern that I think is a legitimate concern that we all should have, whether you even think it's okay or not. Safety is a paramount priority. Marijuana is safer than alcohol, so we should regulate marijuana like alcohol. This argument can be summed up like this one. Alcohol is harmful and legal, so let's make another harmful substance legal. But it doesn't make a lot of sense. There is one issue before the vote of this fall, and that is whether to allow the commercialized marijuana industry in Massachusetts. If, if we vote yes, we know we will see increased youth consumption, increased health risks for youth and adults, and increased access to other addictive substances as families continue to grapple with the opioid crisis. And I just want to, you know, something new comes out every day. This, this came out uh, on June 7th uh, from KUSA in Denver, the reporter Kyle Dyer. The number of teenagers in the Denver metro area who are experimenting with drugs and dealing with addiction is becoming a health problem of epic proportions. Dennis Ballinger is one of Colorado medical professionals and can attest to that. Ballinger is the clinical manager with all health network which focuses on treating mental health and addiction issues. In April, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services reported that Colorado leads all states in regular marijuana use among 12 to 17 year olds. Teen marijuana use increased 24% after Colorado allowed medical marijuana in 2010. That number increased another 8% after the passing of recreational marijuana on 2013, and on and on and on. There is no evidence that the marijuana black market has dried up in Colorado, and this is the, uh, the article about, if I'm not mistaken, the, the Cuban nationals who moved from Florida into Colorado mixed their illegal grows in with the legal grows, making it you know, really difficult for the state, federal, and local authorities to figure out you know, what's the illegal stuff versus the legal stuff. And it was, it was discovered because the neighbors were looking at in these areas where there were homes for sale, these houses all of a sudden they bought up and bought up and bought up and turned into you know, greenhouses, basically. And the stink that comes from this is, is you know, palpable. So they called the police, the police came, and they uncovered this, you know, Cuban uh, cartel growing this stuff all over the area in these houses that they bought up that were for sale. And the, the stuff was being exported out of the state, and some of it was being exported to Mexico. So can you imagine we're growing this stuff in Colorado and exporting it to Mexico? Yeah, and you see the size of the plant there? So when you think of a plant, we all think of a plant. And so you see the significance. And they all start like a little plant, and uh, that's how big a plant can grow. So when you think about 12 being grown in a home, 
that's a significant amount, far more than any individual can consume personally. Legalization would not be the new source of revenue in Massachusetts. A special Senate Committee's report shows that tax revenues would barely cover the regulatory enforcement and public health costs. And then you talk a little bit about the tax rate proposed in our ballot law versus what this is back in Colorado. Colorado is 25% excise. So initially they started at 15, they increased it to 10, to 10, so it's 25, and then they add the 2.9% sales tax on there that they have in Colorado. So 227.9%. Washington State, 37% excise right across the board. Um, and so the revenue is certainly better there because obviously the numbers are higher. Governor Hickenlooper will tell you himself, don't, if you're doing this for revenue, don't bother because the revenue isn't above all the costs that come associated with the regulatory costs that are associated with it. However, the Massachusetts ballot question that's on the ballot has the excise tax at 3.75%. However, they do allow for the sales tax. So it'll, you can get the, the sales tax, the state sales tax at 6.25. But that's not dedicated, that's just sales tax. Anything you sell in Massachusetts is sales tax. So the, the, the excise is only 3.75. The industry will argue it will cut the black market because it will make it more affordable and so the black market won't be able to survive in that environment. Now you see how profitable it can be, so I don't think that's going to be the case. However, at 3.75%, even if we take into consideration the sales tax, that's two-thirds less revenue than Colorado. You know, a quarter, three quarters less than Washington State and so you can imagine that all of these regulatory costs, all of the concerns, not to mention the outside costs that are, uh, that are, that are going to be in this, are going to be borne by the taxpayer. Because I am convinced that if they're making $100 million right now in tax revenue in Colorado, you take two-thirds less of that, 30 some odd million, is not going to be enough to regulate, educate, do all the things necessary to expand and open up this entirely new industry. So, this, this is something that is, and again, this ballot question was written by the industry. This is what they believe was the right thing. I would suggest that that is not the right thing. Why would we even think of the legalization of what's happening to this generation right now? The North Shore of the high school, because our state is already decriminalizing the personal use and we made it legally available for that to use the question. to this, and I frankly think a lot of people thought, you know what, just legalizing marijuana, it's, it, most people have the perception of marijuana as Mr. Kramer talked about back in the days of, of uh, Woodstock and even into the 80s and 90s, that was just the regular marijuana grows, which is two and a half percent THC. It is a far different product. It is, matter of fact, there's a court case going on right now that is challenging the ballot question because it talks about legalizing marijuana, and yet, we know that it's hashish oil and all of these the subsidiaries of this particular product that are going to be legalized, not just the marijuana joint. And that is something that we believe is of concern because it is a far more um, broad product than that we know of. And when we vote for this, we're going to be voting on something that is going to transform and change that is going to be easily accessible all over the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And so, um, and it's going to be harder to change the law after the fact. Because if people say, oh, well, you know, we'll fix it after, we'll fix it after. Once this thing becomes legal, the industry's going to come out and say, hey, wait a second, the people have spoken. You can't touch this law. You'll, you know, you'll destroy our industry. You can't do this. And then after the fact, I know as a legislator, you become, you know, hey, the people spoke. You know, we gave them, and it becomes harder to change. So, They'll argue we can change these things after the fact. We can put more restrictions on after the fact. We can increase taxes after the fact. All those things. <clears throat> when you've got a vote by the people, and whatever that vote is, you say the people have spoken, it becomes much harder for a legislative process to change. So, you know, resources from which you can access more information, learn about this yourselves, educate yourselves. 
www.sacredmilitarymaster.com. There's a Twitter feed or page or whatever the Twitter is. And the Special Senate Committee Report, which is available uh, at www.sacredmilitarymaster.com. And that's, a, that's the way it's an eye opening report. The marijuana industry is targeting the poor and minorities, just like the alcohol industry. It's in the marijuana industry has concentrated in poor minority neighborhoods, one of which has a pot business for every 47 residents. This is similar to the alcohol industry at Johns Hopkins study found that low-income African-American neighborhoods in Baltimore were eight times as likely to have liquor stores as white and racially integrated neighborhoods. More black and Hispanic youth are being arrested for pot Colorado after legalization than before. So what does that suggest? That the use by the kids who this is not supposed to be sold to and can't be sold to legally are getting even more of it. Why? Because there's more of it available. And pot edibles which are much more dangerous than joints because of the concentration of tetrahydrocannabinol now account for 50% of the Colorado market. So if they can't sell that stuff, they're not going to be successful. They need this high potency edible product to be able to succeed. These are some of the hazelnut spread that we tell them. Dab with the color Sex cells is pretty girl behind this. We want to show you that whole Yeah. Trying to be. This is just some of the advertising that you're going to see in Colorado. This is uh, Sam is a, is a nationwide organization that has been trying to educate uh, people about this proliferation across the, the uh, across the country. But these are the ads that are out there. We, of course, we're not seeing them in Massachusetts now, but this is what's going on in Colorado and Washington State uh, and up the, other, the other two states that are legalizing. And you just see that, you know, this is, you know, this, this is what will be in Massachusetts. You will see this every, you know, everywhere. Um, and again, the question is that we have to ask ourselves, are we in the Commonwealth ready for this? Do, is this what we want? And you have to ask yourself this question and understand how the industry is going to spend a great deal of time and a great deal of effort to continue to increase their market share and their base and their product because they think their product is a better product and they want to sell more of it. So, um, so in, in conclusion, you know, I've said many times in talking about this issue since, you know, I can't remember when, if some 30 year old What we're concerned about is that we're going to put in front of children with the imprimatur of the adult community, this is not serious, it's just marijuana. That is a bad message. And it is going to increase by kids the use of this drug. And let me suggest respectfully to you, if you think we have an opiate crisis now, Five years, ten years down the road, if we take this step, that opiate crisis is going to be worse. So, again, don't take my word for it. Vinny can speak for himself. I would just urge you to do as much as you can to educate yourself about this. Um, there are so many different uh, sources of information. We've provided a couple of them to you. But you know, look up, Google up a woman named Bertha Madras, M-A-B-R-A-S. Dr. Bertha Madras was the uh, head of the Office of White House Drug Control Policy for many years. She left in 2008, came back to Harvard Medical School, where she is in the Department of Psychiatry. And read some of Martha, who's one of the leading 
researchers and professional medical people in this area. Just read some of her material on this, and, and you, you know, you'll be, uh, you'll be educated as you do that. And then you'll be able to cast a, uh, a comfortable vote, because you'll know what you're voting for, okay? So thank you for listening to us today. And in closing, if there are any questions that you have uh, in regards to the presentation, please, uh, you know, please let us know. Or if there's any other information you want, um, we're, you know, we're just we're just doing our job to go out there. Um, this is something that he and I do. We have day jobs, um, but we really believe, as the governor, the attorney general, the mayor, the speaker, uh, a whole bunch of legislators across the Commonwealth, after spending time and understanding this, realize that this is far more extensive. Uh, than we saw, and now that we understand and have a greater understanding, uh, and we have the benefit of looking at Colorado and saying, geez, you know what, even if you're in favor of this, think about a lot of the things that haven't been done and get baseline data. That was one thing that Colorado said to us, was, you know, you guys can do what you want, but if I were you, I would wait to get baseline data, find out how many people are getting kicked out of school because they were high? How many people ended up in emergency rooms? How many kids are ending up because of uh, accidental overdoses? Get statistics so that you have a baseline so that when you do legalize, you can see what the ramifications are. And I think that's an interesting perspective. So even if you support the concept, understand that we don't have that baseline data. We don't have the information. And that's what Colorado said. They were taken aback. They didn't think that legalization would happen. The entire uh, legislative process, individuals, no one thought it would happen. And of course, it happened, and now they're dealing with it. And they, they have to deal with it. And it's part of, it, it's part of, it's in their constitution. It's actually written into their constitution now because of the ballot question. And so now they're, they're dealing with that ramifications. I think even if you want this, think about, in my personal opinion, think about maybe we should wait four years, get that baseline data, and then decide if we're going to do um, that would be my suggestion. Because I, I, I think it's a mistake, but at least you get a better sense of it when you understand what the, the things. Because I, I tell you, I, we get studies, and every we, we have a ton of studies that certainly back our position. But then you'll see studies that you know the industry will pay for that will say the opposite. And so, the, every, for every argument we'll make, there's another. Who's telling the truth here? Now, I would suggest to you, I do. I, I feel pretty confident that I'm telling the truth and not lying. The district attorney, I feel very confident. But the industry will tell you that we are lying, that we're prohibitionists, that we want to go back to you know the 1920s where you you know, pro, you know prohibition of alcohol. That's not where we're coming from. We're just trying to be rational and reasonable and knowing where we're at as a commonwealth of Massachusetts, knowing the challenges that we're facing now um, with addic addictive substances, would this be the time to open up those doors? I respectfully say I don't believe so, and I, I think the district attorney and a lot of other of my colleagues feel the same way. So thank you, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Yes. Jim, Jim, Jim is an advocate. He's the spokesperson for the legalization of marijuana in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Jim, what question do you have for us? Thank you. Uh, I just want to point out I was not invited to speak today. I'm not going to be a to the garden party. But I would like to think that Cape Cod residents are bloody capable of listening to opposing views and coming to an opinion on their own. But I was not if, invited if to If you speak. would like to, I would like to speak more than happy. Happy. I, I would be more than happy. I tried to be an official speaker to join you and the DA, and I would have liked that. But at this point, I think that I'd rather wait until Thursday when I am going to be in the, on the panel with you so I can point out the many, many inaccuracies that you had said and the district attorney had said respectfully. Okay. You know what? I have one question. Yeah. Which newspaper has come out against this? You just saw the, the, the editorial from the Boston Globe. That editorial was, that was an opinion piece. What newspaper has officially come out against it? I, I, I don't know, I just saw the Herald the other day, and they just told, totally tore this thing apart after the Trooper McCarty thing. All I want to point out, no new, I'm communications director. I'm in communications with all of these editorial mm -hmm. boards. Not a single newspaper has come out against this yet. I'm sure many will, 
not one as yet. What the Globe came out against was they came out for a far more liberal uh, petition that was trying to make the ballot that didn't make the ballot because it didn't get enough signatures. The Globe supported that, which was the, the tomato model. No restrictions on growth, no restrictions on possession. They said, we should go with that model. Uh, and they said, let's not go with the regulated model, which is ours. So again, I'm not going to be the guy, that's not going to be the guy party here, but any time anybody wants to hear why we're proposing this, why we actually want to control marijuana and regulate it, rather than let the drug dealers who have been dominating this market for, what, 80 years? Why keeping them in control of the market rather than the state and the local authorities? I'm glad to talk to anybody, anytime, and I will show, I will present stats, not industry stats, stats from Colorado, state departments of Colorado, that will completely refute a lot of what you heard here today, including the fact that they're not paying for it. They're easily paying for it. I have all, I have the exact budget items of every department of Colorado that has anything to do with this, and they are, the, the receipts are far exceeding the expenditures. That's just a fact. At 28%? At 28%, how much, how much did the Marijuana Enforcement Division spend last year on its budget to enforce the entire industry? All the regulations, all the enforcement, all the inspections, do you know? So 3.75%. I asked you a question, do you know how much they spent I told you what, what, the, what the rate is in Colorado, which is which is 25 plus the 2.9, 27 point. This one is 3.75 percent. Yes. So it, it is. Would you suggest that that's a smaller, a, a far smaller amount? It's a far smaller amount. Okay. Uh, okay. And so I'm suggesting that I only quoted you what Governor Hickenlooper said. Governor Hickenlooper said, "If you're doing this for the money, don't, because it, it, it's not the cash crop that you think it is." Governor Hickenlooper last week told the Los Angeles Times that legalization is working in Colorado. He said it's working in Colorado. My the speaker opinion. of the house in the Globe story that you guys were in said it's working in Colorado. There was a poll, put in that poll last November of the people of Colorado. More people support it now than they did when they voted for it in 2012. So well, as, 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 can you just one, one second? You know, as, as one of the slides indicated, um, if you think it's bad, not wait till they get lobbyists. Wait till they get lobbyists. And those government officials in Colorado who will speak kindly of this now, I would suggest have been buried alive by these lobbyists who are raising money for them. Let's not go down this road until we at least do what Vinny has suggested. There is a laboratory in Washington and Colorado from which we can learn a great deal and examine those uh, statistics over the next four, eight years and take a look at why is the Netherlands the most liberal society in the world rolling back what they did 30 years ago because it's wreaked havoc on their society. So let's not do that here. Let's gather the data, look at it, and then make a more intelligent decision about whether we want this multi-billion dollar industry in our state. Thank you. A um, couple of quick comments I'd like to offer. Um, I sort of feel like I've watched you read for the uh, madness, sort of for you, uh, a lot of exaggeration, uh, certainly no objectivity. There's a reason why four states and countries across the planet are uh, looking at this issue again. They've seen very clearly that the model prohibition has been a visible thing. Just like alcohol prohibition report, it allows the criminal element to enter into the marketplace, allows access for young people. In a regulated marketplace, you may still have some of that, but it would be much more difficult. Think how challenging it is for young people now to access alcohol. Not too easy. Uh, and right now, you talk to any young person, it's easier to get marijuana than it is to get alcohol. We've been using marijuana as a substance for thousands of years. The last three presidents have acknowledged using it. Uh, one, one statistic that you did mention, according to the Center for Disease Control, approximately 400,000 people 
Uh, the last few presidents have used it. Do, are they, were they using it now? I mean, are they using the same product? Are they, are they using the marijuana of the 2.5? Are they using the, the marijuana today? I mean, because if it's, if it's there, I'm sure that President Obama is using it now. President Clinton is using it now. I, I think I would suggest a couple of them are using it now, but I, I can't attest to that because they would have been there if they were. There's actually an article recently on Obama's. He came out and quote, I think, quote him, I think, and provided you the article where he said that he didn't want to, he want, he's, he's not against legalizing because he doesn't believe in creating incarceration, criminal records for people, which isn't happening. And that he does not want his own daughters to do it because it is unhealthy, it um, creates, you know, they're not producing anything and for their well being. So I can, at, when they're happy to give you that, send you an email with it. Um, That's fine. You, you but he has actually come out again saying that it does nobody any good. Let me just finish the one statistic that I think is an important one for people to, to at least walk away from this meeting with no. As I said, according to the Center for Disease Control, in most of this year that has statistics, about 400,000 people died from tobacco use. My own brother passed away recently from that. 30,000 died from alcohol use. Uh, approximately 18,000 died from prescription, legal prescription drug use. About 10,000 died from heroin overdose. And in the history of this plan, there has never been a reported death by overdose in marijuana. How can we put people in jail for buying and selling We product? don't. Live. Yes, we do. If you buy and sell marijuana, you're creating a criminal purpose. Yes, uh, if you're, a, if you're a, a marketer of the If you sell product. or buy marijuana, right. you're creating a crime. That's How can we? continue to criminalize people for using a substance that according to every scientific standard is less toxic and less addictive than alcohol or tobacco. It is absurd. This policy of prohibition has caused far more harm to this country. We've got mass incarceration. We've got criminal justice lobby that relies on this drug war as a jobs program, as a revenue source. That's probably why you see most of the sheriffs and most of the DAs proposed to a more modern, more reasonable approach, a lack of prohibition as a model for going forward. We should be focusing this issue as a public health issue, not as a criminal matter. If you want kids to have more access to marijuana, keep it illegal. Keep the prohibition model in place. That guarantees you to have access to it. That's, that's respectfully, sir, not what the data suggests. Well, that's and I'd love to see your site. I noticed that in most there, cases you didn't include sites on those the slides. federal government. Oh, I will provide for everything that we have here. We will have we have the, the data as far as that goes. It's the Rocky Mountain. We have the, 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 the presentation. This was done by law enforcement, the DEA cooperation. I have the I have the yeah, data. It's Rocky Mountain High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area. They are a branch of the DEA. They are what? They're a branch of the DEA. Oh, okay. Yeah, the federal they government. are funded by the DEA. You do realize that, don't you? They employ no reason. Is that the federal government? Yes. That was, that's our argument. It's the federal government. So, well, so yes, they're the making up lies. Of course. So what you're DEA. suggesting, yeah, yeah. I, I would say, why don't we look at studies by universities, not the, in, I'm not the industry, by the way. I grew up in Massachusetts. I'm not the industry. You know, let's look at studies by credible, Third-party interests. So, no, so I'm not the industry. industry. So you're just pulling this out of the good of your heart. Are you, are you being are you being compensated? I'm being compensated. You're being compensated. Yes, I'm being compensated. Yeah, no. So this is what I do. I'm a professional communicator. I'm being compensated. I was right. in the district attorney's office in Suffolk County for seven years. I had the I'm sheriff's not office. This. Yeah. I was not the sheriff's office. You, did you work with Peter Foreman at one point? Peter yeah. Foreman. He was chief of staff when I was in government. So, yes, but, but I know people want to No, but I've never worked in the show, so okay. I have to I think, I think, I think, No, but I don't mind. I want to have this debate because it is a legitimate debate. And I don't. Listen, I you do. You do. You're I want to have it today with you guys. Well, listen, I wasn't allowed. I, 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 are, you going, listen, are you going to on um, Thursday? Yes. They asked me. I said, I would love to have you there. So that, as far as I'm going to be there on Thursday, you're going to be there. They asked me. I said, absolutely. Now, of course, he and I were just going doing our presentation. Yes. But if you want to make the, the other argument, listen, you have been to plenty of places where we're not going and saying, oh, no, you know, here's the other side of the equation. You do that. You go on the radio. We are just doing our presentation. If you want to be part of it, we're certainly fine with that. Well, I would suggest I asked to be part of it. Huh? I, I asked. Well, again, this I is a decision. No. It's a, 
That's yeah. fine. Let me just clarify for the record that the chamber, I respect for our legislator, uh, the CEO, and uh, Michael O'Keefe, that, that we are a private nonprofit organization. We wanted to allow the presentation. I mentioned to you, this is open to the public. It's free of charge, and you had every right to come and say a piece that you have been able to do yes, today. I have. Okay. So, so it, it, just so that you know, this is not trying to stifle your voice. This is us doing our presentation. You go out and do your presentation. You were at the Chamber of Commerce and Social Chamber, and you gave your presentation to the Government Affairs Board. That's fine. And we'll go and do our presentation, and ultimately people will be educated. Our goal is you have your, your facts, we have our facts. Clearly we disagree. However, um, it's not a bad thing that we disagree. It's it, this is what you know. This is part of the, the. This is a campaign. You think it's a good idea. We think we 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 disagree. So we make our case. There's nothing wrong with that. That's that's it. That's what's great about this 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 country. Yes, you I can have that happy. I, I have all the respect in the world for you to make your case, as I would like to think you would have for us. Even though you disagree with our facts, you're going to talk about your facts. We're going to talk about what we believe is our facts. Rocky on high intensity, that is the DEA. So you may not believe the federal government. We may believe the federal government. That's an argument you know, that you, you can have. But I'm only sharing what we believe from our perspective is a challenge. Okay, so I'm going to make one point to that. Yeah. The DEAs, we saw this in North Dakota, they had the bag of land at the other day. What, what I object to is when these are described as seminars. They're not described. It's okay. a it's a campaign. It's an opposition campaign event. Neither of you are objecting to oppose legalization. But the ben, that's the official opposition campaign. Correct. All I'm Correct. saying is that if this is going to be, why not advertise it accurately, saying that this is a, a campaign where you're going to hear a, a arguments against. Yeah. And that, that was videoed, and in, we went up, up and we said exactly that. I know, but in way, but it, it wasn't advertised. It, it's titled so Find Out. Look at the notice. It's not. It's advertised as a seminar, like the way that one was that uh, Michael Morrissey uh, put together. It was a seminar where you can get information. Certainly not. But all the information was against. I'm just saying truth in advertising, and let the people know, the people here know, that it was not going to be. If I wasn't here. And this gentleman wasn't here. There'd be nobody, I assume, speaking in for the initiative that's going to be before. I'm just saying, let people know what the Chamber of Commerce. How many people were speaking, 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 speaking against the industry when we went to the Southern Chamber of Commerce? We asked if we could speak. Here we go. Let's well, we go. asked. Exactly what but if you guys wanted to speak, I'm sure Peter would have let you. I we didn't say we don't let anybody talk. But we're just going out. We're not thinking about, hey, let's let's make sure everywhere we go, you get your 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 say. We're just doing our part. Also, the South Shore Chamber, chamber, by the way, didn't right, put out a notice. What? The South Shore Chamber didn't put out a notice. All right, let's, let's, let's wrap summer. this up. Let's wrap this up. I appreciate that. Everyone, 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 I just want to make okay. one, one additional one point with thing. respect to the data of the 24 uh, percent increase in teen use from the 12 to 17 year old people. That data, though it's printed in this Rocky Mountain High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area report, it is from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, the MSDUA, an annual survey sponsored by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration of the federal government. It isn't the DEA. So that is by the National Association of Medical Law. Go go so I'm familiar with that study. It was less than 900 teenagers. The study we cited was, was 40,000 teenagers in Colorado. It was a Healthy Kids Colorado survey by the Department of Education in Colorado. It is no comparison. Once again, let's throw studies at each other. I'm willing to do that and let the people decide which study accurately reflects what's actually going on. So Jim, I, I, I reverence, reverence the opportunity to be able to have that. To have that. I, I'm not trying to, I share with my perspective, you share your perspective, and then let the people decide. I'm and and I, I am totally supportive of that. Thursday, you know what, on Thursday, they call me up. I said, absolutely, I have no problem going, you know, and, and, and arguing our statistics. Just like I talk about the you know the AAA study, I didn't make that up. We didn't you know fabric A because we have AAA in Massachusetts. People are dying, and I think that's a legitimate issue. AAA showed no impairment, huh? Now, we can talk about the AAA. We, 
I'll be glad to talk about the trip. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it. Everybody have a good morning. Thank you.